By the early 80s, I'd spent a few years doing music videos in London for bands that were coming through like The Jam and Adam and the Ants, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. Interesting visual and, you know, new wave sounds that were coming out and we were doing as much as we could kind of conceptual videos or story videos. You know, we didn't quite know what it was yet because MTV hadn't come along. Then suddenly MTV opened up in the States and the demand was much more there from the record companies to, for us to do our best work and therefore we got a slightly bigger budget. We started forming more of an idea of what what people were looking for or what would be interesting. There wasn't, didn't seem to be any ground rules for what was a video at that point. I think music videos in the 80s probably made movies a bit quicker cut in terms of editing because everything or a lot of it became about the pace and the adrenaline of the way the audience would see something or appreciate something. So it felt like things were speeding up, things were getting faster, things were more immediate, th things were looking for more impact. And I think that, that probably fed back into movies. Even when I was doing music videos in the late 70s, I didn't think about directing movies, even though I'd been a camera assistant, I'd been a clapper loader, so I'd been on the set a lot. I really still didn't fully understand what the director's role really was. I mean, what the full scope of it was. I knew what the bit I saw on the set was about. I just didn't know the full thing. So it wasn't an ambition I had to, to be a to be a movie director kind of fell into it. I was quite young and these videos were getting more and more attention and uh, suddenly I was getting offered scripts from Hollywood. I crossed paths with Rusty through my mother Zelda and she was in, in the business. At that time she was doing continuity, which is script supervising. She later became a director. In fact, she directed her first movie at the same time as I did Electric Dreams, my first movie. And we got in the Guinness Book of Records for that hadn't happened with a mother's son before. In the early 80s, she was working on a film called uh, Yentl with Barbara Streisand. And Rusty was working as a producer on Yentl. He was watching some of the videos that I was doing. And he said to my, my mum, would, would Steve be interested in, uh, in doing a, a, a movie? I've written this movie that's uh, it's about it's music based and it's about future technology and it just seems like what he do, he's doing in music videos. In particular, he'd seen the Michael Jackson, Billie Jean, and he said it should, you know, sh it should be a natural to do it. And he hadn't, at the time, he hadn't raised the money for it, but he sent it to me and I thought, this, this sounds really great and it sounds like a real fun thing to do and, and that, that would be amazing to do it. The conceit of the triangle between the, the boy, the girl, and the computer, the Serrano de Bergerac base that Rusty had used for the concept was really a good idea. And it felt like it was doing what we were trying to do in, in music videos, which was kind of drive through a new cutting edge world of attention and, uh, and production. And that felt like it, was, it fit right in to go and then do this movie about a desktop computer because they were going to be the future. You knew they were. They weren't at the time, you know, hardly anyone I knew had one, but you felt people were going to get these things. They were going to start linking up your place. And obviously that's all going on now. Funnily enough, some of the things took many years and some of them were instantly available. Hello? You talk. Richard was a friend of my sister who was in a relationship with his cousin. And so I got to know Richard quite early, kind of going on holiday with him and going to Menorca and playing tennis and, and mucking about. So on a personal level, I you know, saw the early Richard and knew him quite well. And so as soon as I read it, I said to Rusty, I should send this to, to Richard because I think he would like this and the music part of it. So we went, actually went up to his barge, over to his boat, and we sat there and, and Richard was thumbing through the script as he was chatting to us and, and he said, yeah, I've read it, yeah. He said, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think we could do this. And within 12 weeks, we were filming it. You know, it was like one of those rare things. I thought, this is what always happens because I, it was my first 
time kind of trying to get the finance to get the movie and, and Richard was always amazing and, and cavalier. If he saw something that he thought would work, he'd just say yes and then he'd figure out how to do it later. And the budget that Rusty brought in his friend Larry DeWay to, to budget it and it came up to seven million dollars, which is quite a bit, not, you know, not top of the range, Hollywood, but it's quite a bit for an English production. But uh, Richard wasn't phased by that at all. And in fact, he then rang up MGM the following week, I think, and said, I've got this movie. We're going to do the music. I've got Human League and all these people that can do it. And they, I think they gave him $6 million, like immediately over the phone as an offer. So he got all his money back as an advance before he'd you know, even started in the way that he does. And he didn't even know that that was how he was supposed to do it, I don't think, but it just, it was just the way it worked. Yeah, Virginia Madsen walked in, did, did a, an audition for us, for the part, and she just seemed so genuinely warmed and beautiful and, and just innocent and natural. She was just the one when she, when she came in. It just seemed right. And then for the boy, we looked around quite a bit. Rusty was very keen on Lenny Von Dolan, and I went to see a couple of films he was in, and he's striking on the screen. I mean, I, I don't know, it might be an urban myth, but somebody told me in recent years, actually it was one of the people from MGM, that Tom Hanks had come in for the Red for it, wanted to do it. But uh, for some reason it never got to me. <laughs> but that might, be, uh, might have been another story. You never asked me m my name. Well, what is it? Edgar. Yeah, Bud Court was uh, Rusty's idea. He was a massive fan of Harold and Maud, the movie. And when he played me his voice, I just thought he was absolutely right. Rusty was dead right. It was, it was like a great voice. And obviously, because it was my first movie, I didn't know how everything was going to work. So we ended up bringing Bud over to read the lines. Because there was a number of scenes where he's talking to the computer. And so Bud... Came, became like an actor on the set, but we built a little cubicle for him to, to do it and run it through a speaker on, onto the computer. So during the actual filming, uh, Lenny in particular and Virginia could talk to the computer and little Bud Court would be talking back from a little cubicle off the side of the stage. Uh, don't touch. A few of the technical issues that came up because the film was about uh, the centre it was about a computer uh, were technically it's just a bit fiddly to film off of, off a screen uh, exposure wise and technically to lose some flicker and, and those sort of things so we did have a few issues but I brought a few people in from our music videos like the editor David Yardley who came in and edited all the stuff that went onto the screen even though we cut it on film you know we'd done quite a lot of assembling on video, which was very unusual at the time. Nobody was editing digital, but we did some of it that way. So really I wasn't, the technical side of it was the least unusual for me because I worked through a lot of that stuff in the videos that we'd done. We shot most of it in the UK. We did all the exteriors outside her house in San Francisco. We really established, you know, the world of San Francisco and Alcatraz and everything for that section. But it was only a couple of weeks, and then the other, I'd say eight or nine weeks, we shot it in England. I mean, a lot of it took place in the apartment, so we built that apartment. Obviously found the house in San Francisco first, so the windows would be the right shape and everything. We thought, right, this is the exterior, now let's build the interior in the UK. And we didn't use the interior in the US at all. I was really young and naive. Three years earlier, I was the clapper loader, the T-boy, with a lot of this crew, and the camera crew in particular. And so to suddenly be the boss, with still with me long hair and me spots, spotty face, was, was something that was obviously uh, odd. I kind of got used to it pretty quick. And I, I'd never felt the pressure of like, here's, I'm, you know, now you're leading this seven million dollar film. And somehow, it, now I think back on it, I was, whatever, I was 25, 26, so you know, running this big budget thing. But I, I think because of the music videos, I'd kind of run out there and, and just done it and just, 
not thought about the, the pressure of you know, spending that, that amount of money and calling all the shots. The, the actual the filming of it was all pretty harmonious. It, it just kind of flew by. It always takes a year to make a movie. It was a fun year with you know, a lot of adventure and things and a totally new world for me of discovery. I was discovering about filmmaking as opposed to picture making, I suppose, visual making. I, I, was, a, I was much more a visualist, so I didn't think in terms of what the impact of different words would be or dial, you know, dialogue or sound in particular. Audio was a new one. When, when we got in to do the, the mix of the audio, and we're putting together things and I'm like, oh my God, we get that sound, we put that sound. Oh, I, I suppose if I'd have known certain things or done, had the experience, I might have shot things in a slightly different way because sometimes, you know, you, I was telling it all visually and sometimes you're gonna tell it with audio or you're gonna tell it with atmosphere. That's something that's very hard to know unless you go to, I didn't go to film school, I didn't learn that sort of thing. All I did was I was a, my film school was T-Boy on set, was like nobody telling you anything. You were just watching and observing and through the cameras, because I was in the camera department, that's what I knew and was comfortable with. But I'd never been in a, a mixing suite and seen what you could do in surround sound with 120 tracks of sound and layers that can change the tone and story of any scene. That was all fresh and new, and in a way, I probably would have done the film a little differently if it had gone back straight away, armed with that new understanding. Where begin? First rhythm. Flashdance had been out, and Georgia Moroda had written the, the soundtrack for that, and it was so strong and, and connected so well with MTV. You know, he signed on to, to, to do the score, Giorgio brought me this demo that he had. He, he said, I, I do a lot of demos, and when I find a good tune or a good melody, I just get someone in to, to sing it uh, with any old words, and, and it gives me the melody, and I, and I keep it on the shelf. And he said, I've got one that I, I've done. I really think it's perfect for this movie as the main theme song. Hello, hello. This is dedicated to the ones I love. He's played me this song, and it was kind of very poppy and I felt I was trying to get a little edge to the film so, so there'd be nothing too mainstream too M.O.R. they called it middle of the road and I felt this song sounded more like a, a Neil Diamond song maybe because of the singer who's singing the the, de the demo on it and, and the words he was singing as well might have thrown me into that but it was basically the tune of Together in Electric Dreams he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, yeah, it's really nice. You know, can we get someone interesting to, to sing it? And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, whoever, whoever, you know, whoever you want. And I said, well, I've been doing these videos for Human League. I did Don't Don't You Want Me and Love Action and, and a, f a few of those. And Phil Oakey had this kind of slightly droll, harsh voice that wasn't so melodic and, and lyrical. And I, I thought, well, if you... Can we, can we use Phil Oakey? And I thought that might at least counteract the melodic side of the song. So he was fine with that. Phil Oakey said, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it as a kind of solo thing, but I'll write the lyrics. Phil was very meticulous. They took quite a while to do their album, Dare. They, you know, they spend a long time in the studio but he came into this and he showed Giorgio the lyrics and Giorgio said, well, don't, don't, I won't read them. Uh, come in and just sing them into the microphone and then I'll get a better sense. And so he ran the track, put his headphones on, ran the track for Phil. And Phil you know, said, we'll always be together, together in electric, you know, ran the thing to show Giorgio what he'd written on the way there. And he pressed the button to stop it, Giorgio, and, and said, uh, that's great. I said, that's great. He's like, well, Phil said, what do you mean? He said, well, that's it, we got it. He said, no, no, I was just playing, seeing whether you like the lyrics. And it, it, it can't be it. He said, well, well, we do another one. And they did one more. And he said, that's great. We'll always be together, together in Phil was really shocked that he'd been in the studio for 
like a moment and Giorgio was happy and ready to go and, and he's you know a big record producer and he wanted to take that and that was the song. You know, it was one of those things, I think MGM had not had much success over the previous three or four years and they were hoping this was going to be the one and they were really wanting it to be. They put it out in like a thousand cinemas. They really pushed it and I, I think the first weekend, I can't remember what they wanted to get, but we didn't get anything like what they were hoping to get in, in the opening weekend. And what I then discovered is that, you know, it's all about that opening weekend that it's what dollars you're going to get in that opening weekend informs everything about the life of that movie, the success or the failure of that movie. And we didn't have a great opening weekend. I remember sitting at the Sunset Marquee in LA just after it had come out with Richard Branson around the pool and we were sitting there and this was our Hollywood dream. And uh, I think we were silent for a few minutes and then I just Richard said, oh well. <laughs> And that kind of summed it up. Really, come on, you're gonna squash my clarinet. Your hand, my I think then Virgin released it themselves in the UK. I think it did okay in the UK, I seem to remember. I don't I don't know the figures and things. But by then I'd understood the world of movies and the world of Hollywood was all about exact dollar figures on a couple of days. And that kind of threw me completely as a as a director, and I, I came out of, out of Electric Dreams just wanting to go back to music videos. And I still got offered a few films and things, but I was, I was like, I didn't understand that world. It, it was too, too strange that it could be all about that when you put so much into something. The film definitely gave me the tools to, to do more movies, and, and to, you know, I learned a lot from it. And, Actually, the second film I did was the opposite, it was a massive hit, it came from something that nobody wanted to do, that everybody thought was going to be ridiculous and bad, to something that was a massive, massive hit. So I did the exact opposite journey. I suppose, you know, every, everything informs you. You grow, you learn from your experiences, and Electric Dreams was a particular special experience that I really, I feel I grew and learnt from.